you could have the best systems in the world, hire the best cybersecurity experts, but if you've got that one staff member that clicks on that one email because they're expecting that package <laughs> and entering information off guard, then you've undone everything that you've set out to, to achieve. Welcome back to the business behind your business. And again, I'm joined by Luke Icavelli from Unitech IT Solutions. And the reason we've got Luke back is we need to talk about a very topical subject at the moment, and that is the Optus data breach. And if you've been missing the news or not aware of what's gone on, or maybe you're coming back to this at a later point, the Optus data breach has some wide ranging implications for business owners, not just in Australia, but possibly in other countries as well. So Luke, Welcome back to the microphone. Yes, thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me. It'd be great to have you back on a more friendly subject than what we're talking about today, but this Optus data breach, well, it's an interesting thing that's happened and perhaps the best place for us to start is explain what actually happened. Yeah, certainly. It looks great to be back and unfortunately talking about a topic that is hitting a lot of people hard and sort of making them realise the seriousness of this. So in essence, as many listeners would, would be aware of, is that Optus had a data breach. So millions of clients' data was hacked into the system and leaked out and is now in the hands of a hacker on the dark web. So in essence, what information has been disclosed by Optus has been very limited, unfortunately, by the company to not only the public, but also the government and the various cybersecurity agencies that are now in place. It is my understanding that the breach has occurred through what they call a phishing email or a targeted email that went to a specific person or people within the organization and a link or some confidential information was leaked of that particular person's account, which allowed the hackers in. What they've then been able to do is obviously work their way through the network, find the data and take what data that they want to take. So a very serious breach for a company as big as Optus, particularly one that works in the technology space. They have millions of dollars <laughs> put aside towards IT budgets and security budgets, and yet here they are in this situation. So really very serious and very disturbing, particularly the seriousness of the type of data that's been taken. Mm. And I think the type of data that's really causing the most concern is the fact that they had identification documents retained on file, including key things like driver's licenses and identification numbers, and perhaps even more. Yes, that's correct. So it's not the fact that data was leaked. It's also, as you rightly point out, the type of data. So as many people would know, when you go into any telco shop or, or you know, apply for some telco services online, there is a series of identification requirements that the telco needs from you, usually a driver's license, some sort of photo ID. In many cases, Medicare cards or passports to create that 100 points of identification. So that information has been taken and what's been leaked. The other part to it is that this doesn't just apply to existing Optus clients. It applies to, funnily enough, Telstra was actually hacked a week after, but anyway, it applies to clients of Optus that are up to 10 years old. So even if you were a client five years ago and are no longer a client of Optus, your data may also be part of that breach. That's the seriousness of this because they've retained the data for that long. Yeah, so you mentioned just a bit of a side comment there is that the Telstra hack yes. as well. So was tel that on the same scale as the Optus? Um, no, it wasn't. It was only around 10,000, which is still a lot, but compared to Optus, a very, very small scale. It was about 10,000 people that information was leaked. It wasn't as serious, and that actually came through a phishing email as well. So, mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so Luke, we've mentioned this phishing email. Can we just yep. clarify what we mean by a phishing yeah, email? Yeah, sure. So what they are is they're emails that come to individual people disguised as potentially a familiar face, such as you know, most common ones are Australia Post, JB Hi-Fi, even the tax office. You know, they look and feel like legitimate emails. And what they do is they can do a range of different things. They can either, upon clicking on something within that email, install programs in the background to your computer or your network. They could potentially open up ports or expose ways for cyber criminals to get into the network. But more importantly, what 
or, or more seriously, what they do is they make you enter in some sort of credential, username, password, or some sort of information that is missing that they may have already collected from you over time, which prompts them to then log into your system. So, you know, please enter your username or password to gain access to this package that you're expecting. Now, with more people buying things online, the Australia Post ones are probably the more serious ones because people go, well, look, I'm expecting that package. So they'll proceed to click on the link. In government related, so the tax office or, you know, that sort of emails, people do tend to click on. And also they can be disguised as even things like your utilities bills, you know, your electricity and gas accounts as well. So really sophisticated ways to get that information. And then once you've exposed it, then, you know, good luck. Mm-hmm. I think one of the reasons why a lot of people are getting upset about this is the retention of the ID documents and the details. And I know like, so as accountants and tax agents, we have quite strict rules about what data we are allowed to retain in our files for identification. We've got new rules requiring us to verify the identity of our clients, which includes citing passports and and driver's license. But under those rules, we're not permitted to retain any copies, either digital or paper copies of those identification documents. The service that we use actually destroys the electronic copies of those documents. And it's really just the process has gone through verifying at the end of the day. So if we who are dealing with sensitive data like tax file numbers and financial information have those strict requirements, how is a company like Optus allowed to retain those key identification documents for such a long period? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think one that there's many different answers to it. And look, me personally, I wasn't even aware that a telco like Optus retained that sort of information for that long. This has sparked a couple of things. It sparked the government to start looking and reviewing the Privacy Act and what changes may need to be implied to that act regarding these modern day cyber threats, but also more importantly around the telco industry or industries as a whole as to what information they need to keep to identify somebody and for how long. You know, Something as simple as walking into an Optus store to sign up to a mobile account, in my opinion, doesn't really require passports, Medicare, and 100 points of ID. A driver's license or something along that, you know, to identify you as a person should be more than sufficient for you to be able to get a SIM card and put it in your phone and away you go. And then to retain that information, again, I have no answer as to why they need to retain it for that long. I have some assumptions and I believe that they keep the information purely for the profiling of clients, both current and past, for marketing purposes and also potentially, you know, leveraging off the opportunity to be able to upsell or resell to those clients again. You know, as far as I'm concerned, if you leave that organization or that company for your services and move elsewhere, then your data should be removed from their system. You know, it's just common sense. It's common, you know, policy and also complies with privacy law. So, you know, again, I put it down to simply trying to profile clients, potentially market to them. If you've got a database of 10 million clients made up of it current and past, you've got a much bigger spread than say, you know, they might only have 2 million active clients. So I believe that's what the issue here is. Why they need to retain it is beyond me. And do they need to retain as far as I'm concerned? No. And I still don't think they need that much level of security. (laughs) You know, you need 100 points of ID to apply for things like passports and government documentation. But to simply get a telco service, it's really, really high end and and very unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this some issues there about the retention of data, which I think really is beyond the control of us as business owners. Uh, We don't have control over that. But what we do have control over is educating our staff, but also how we control the data that we have access to in our systems. Yeah, look, obviously, this situation has made a lot of people aware or more aware of the seriousness of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity and cyber attacks have been around for a long time. And until it happens to you, people don't often realize just how serious it is. And because this is such a big one affecting, you know, the second largest <laughs> telco provider in Australia, 
that the amount of people that this has affected is very serious. So people have gone, oh, it, it can actually happen to me and may have already happened to them. So what business owners need to consider is a few things. The first one is obviously their own cybersecurity regarding their own networks and systems. So you can see how someone as big and as cashed up as Optus, which is backed by a Singapore company, is able to get hacked. And there's been other very large you know, organizations out there that have been hacked as well, that have got the funds to be able to put many measures in place, a lot more measures than small businesses can to prevent this from happening and they still get done. So know your cybersecurity systems and if you don't, find out what you've got and what might be missing. And that might require reviewing or getting an independent person to review that. So know what you've got and put some cybersecurity measures in place. Really come up with some really tight policies around cybersecurity, particularly in the areas of things like bring your own device, which a lot of businesses adopt, particularly in this work from home environment that we live in. Bring your own device. What does that mean for your business? What does that mean around the information that that staff member is accessing on their own device but is relevant to your business? And how the implications occur, particularly if they're using their own device to access your company information, there's often a gray area around what sort of security can be around that. The third one, and probably the most important one, is what we call social engineering, which is the actual human element to all of this. You could have the best systems in the world, hire the best cybersecurity experts, but if you've got that one staff member that clicks on that one email because they're expecting that package (laughs) and enter in information off guard, then you've undone everything that you've set out to, to achieve. So social engineering, or cybersecurity awareness training is a very, very, very big topic and one that really needs to be considered. Have a chat with your staff. Talk to them. Do they understand what cybersecurity is, what the risks and implications are, what to look out for in those sorts of emails that come through? If they're not sure about it, ask someone. Don't just click straight away. Hover over the link to see the sender to see whether or not it is illegitimate. If it doesn't seem right, there's chances that it's not. If you're getting someone coming along and saying to you, oh, we've changed our bank account details, please update your records, and it doesn't seem right, pick up the phone and just ring that client or person and say, look, have you changed your bank account details? Simple things like that can really prevent a major issue from occurring. And there's a range of different cybersecurity training and phishing campaign programs that help business owners, particularly if you're dealing with a larger number of staff across different sites, for example, that allows you to send out fake phishing campaigns and see who clicks and who doesn't click and give them some online training. And that reports back to you to sort of say what the position is in terms of your staffing. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we can do. And I think it What it's really brought home is that it's not just your systems, it's where your data is that's also an issue. And I think a lot of us would probably have a lot of legacy subscriptions or signups on different locations that we probably aren't aware of. So like you mentioned, you know, being an Optus customer 10 years ago and you're still caught by this data breach, is there a way that we could we can do a data audit of where our information is? Is that possible? Look, it's difficult, particularly if you've subscribed to so many different things over the years. I think a part of that policy is to really assess what your systems are and what systems you need and also potentially look at what the privacy policies are regarding some of these vendors or suppliers that you might be dealing with. But you rightly mentioned, Paul, just before that it's not just your systems, it's other people that might be accessing your systems. So, for example, a very common issue that occurs is that there's a lot of buildings or businesses whose air conditioning and building maintenance systems are managed by a third party. So your systems might be tight, but theirs aren't. So the hacker gets into their systems And through their link into your systems, through air conditioning, monitoring, or whatever it might be, then breach your systems to get in because of their their holes that they have. So you need to be aware of who else is accessing your system and do they need that access? Can that access be restricted? Can it be set to certain times when they're doing the maintenance? Um, you know, 24 by 7 monitoring stuff. Uh, unfortunately, you know, many businesses need that and have to have that. Um, but you need to make sure that the third parties that you're dealing with are also 
aware of these risks and are up to scratch with their policies and procedures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so look, cybersecurity, it isn't going to go away. It does affect every business, hopefully not as extremely as it has with the Optus situation, but for a small, medium business, just one incident of a cyber breach could really destroy the business. Absolutely. I mean, you look at small businesses, they make up a very large portion of business community in Australia. And, you know, one breach at a catastrophic level can cripple a business within a few months. Data that's leaked and, and yeah, it's really very serious and it's not going away. It's getting worse and it's going to continue to get worse. And so, you know, the systems and, and measures that are out there are also getting better. But you're never going to get rid of this. It needs to be managed and treated, for better words, as best as it can. And just people need to be more aware of it and more in tune with what's happening out there. And just know that everyone's vulnerable. It's not so much a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And what have you got in place to protect you from that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, Luke, you and I have spoken about cybersecurity and what business owners can do in the past. And in fact, there's a series of, I think, four podcast episodes that we produced some while back, also with David Ferris talking about the cyber insurance aspects, what to do with a breach. So if somebody is just listening or just discovered the podcast, I'd encourage them to go back and listen to those episodes. It should be available in any podcast app service player that you use, or if you can't find it there, head over to our website at www.thebusinessbehindyourbusiness.com. And you'll be able to find all of our past episodes available for you to listen to. And look, if you've got questions, we'd love to hear from you what those questions are. So you can email us at podcast at the business behind your business.com. Luke, thank you for your expert and unemotional opinion on uh, the Optus Data <laughs> Breach because it is quite an emotional and divisive issue for a lot of people. So thank you again for your time today. And thanks for just clarifying some of the, I guess, the practical aspects of what that breach means for our listeners as business owners. Yeah, my pleasure, Paul. Thank you for having me. There's some really great information in some of those previous podcast recordings, but look, if anyone has any further questions, send it through and we'll be happy to help. Great. Fantastic. And look, if you want to get in touch with Luke, the best way to contact Luke would be through... They can send an email through to info at unitech.com.au. They can visit our website, unitech.com.au, or they can give us a call on 1300 IT help. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for your time again today, Luke. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. 